I'm Julie Zenner along with Dennis Anderson and here's what's coming up on Almanac North. Well, the Duluth School District is asking voters to approve a two-tiered operating levy on the November ballot. Tonight we will hear from citizen groups that have lined up on opposite sides of the issue. It's the time of year when high school seniors should be looking for college scholarships. Locally, the Allworth Fund is celebrating 65 years of helping students pay for school. And we'll have the week's business headlines and a news file story from 25 years ago. It's all coming up next on Almanac North. There are some important school issues on local ballots. Well, there's a couple of issues on there that has created some controversy in the community, and we're going to delve into that a little bit yeah, tonight. we've got the controversy right here in our studio tonight, so let's get started. All right, thank you very much, Julie. Well, when Duluth School District residents go to the voting booth on November the 5th, they will have two levy questions to consider. The first will ask voters to extend the current education levy, which will not increase the school portion of current property taxes. The second question, if approved, would increase school funding and also result in a property tax increase for homeowners. Now, two grassroots community groups have lined up on opposite sides of the levy question, and we have invited their representatives to the studio tonight. John Schwetman is a spokesperson for Stand Up for Kids, which supports the passage of the levy. And Paul King is with the Vote No No campaign, which opposes the levy passage. And I want to thank, thank both of you gentlemen for being here tonight. Uh, John, why is passing the levy important for the Duluth School District? Uh, the Duluth School District has been doing a great job over the years. I've been very impressed mm -hmm. by everything I've seen there. I have two kids in it myself. Uh, but the class sizes have gotten really big, and that's the result of many different complicated factors. And one of the biggest factors really is a decrease in state funding. Uh, uh, some of the money comes to the school from the state directly, and mm -hmm. some of it, it comes from the form of citizen, op citizen levies. Uh, unfortunately, the money coming from the state hasn't kept up with inflation, and that's left the schools with less to work with. It also hasn't helped. Uh, at times, the legislature's even borrowed money from that state fund and left the schools to try to work with mm -hmm. that shortfall for, uh, for a year or two before they paid it back. So it's really important uh, for Duluth, like about 90% of other districts in the state, to go to citizen levies in order to make up the shortfall in funding that's coming from the state. Mm -hmm. And I'm wondering too then, Paul, if you can pick up on that, the opposite side of the issue. Why, why you uh, are, are taking the opposite side? And there is a, a, a group here in town that has. Well, inflation basically has nothing to do with it. What we're suffering from is the mismanagement caused by the facilities plan known as the red plan. Uh, that's plaguing the district financially, and it has resulted in, in the school district breaking every promise to the, to the taxpayers that they made from the start, uh, and it has caused uh, a shortfall mm -hmm. in funding for them. And uh, this levy that they're talking about is not going to raise enough money to change anything. And in, in, in your opening statement, you made a comment that there's going to be no tax increase uh, if you vote one, you, you are not correct about that, Dennis. It, there's going to be a tax increase uh, because there is a voter, uh, there is a non-voter approved levy, which the school district is going to pass in December, which is going to result in a 6% tax. So if you vote no, you will still receive a 6% tax. Uh, so, or, I mean, sorry, if you vote, if yes, you vote, vote yes on the, on the first ballot mm -hmm. question, you'll still receive the tax. So uh, they're not really being accurate in their portrayal of this, there being no tax increase this year. No tax increase is no tax increase. But no tax increase would be generated by the levy that they're, that they're asking voters to approve. Is that correct? 
That's correct. I mean, the, the tier one of the levy maintains the, the taxes as they are, and uh, that additional that additional amount was something mm -hmm. the school board had the opportunity to vote for and did. Uh, it should be pointed out too, the school board uh, had the option to do, um, and to uh, in have this tax increase uh, by a school board vote. It chose to take uh, that portion of it to the voters, although it didn't have to. Mm -hmm. uh, in light of uh, recent history, they felt that was the best way. They really wanted to see the citizens, citizens of Duluth really uh, choose to commit to the school district in this way. And so they actually really did turn to the voters as they're doing and as we're put encouraging, um, as encouraging to do and asking the voters to vote yes. John, is the Stand Up For Kids group urging the school board to sell Central High School no matter if another school buys it? The Stand Up For Kids group has no opinion about the selling of Central High School. Really? I mean, honestly, the, the buildings such as Central High School, uh, the budgeting for buildings is a sort of a separate issue from the, the uh, operating levy and the day-to-day uh, -day operations of the school. So you um, haven't so taken, you're, you're not we, endorsing we the sale of Stand to, up for to kids. raise the revenues for the we're school. We're very district. neutral on that issue, um, but we, you know, we, what we're asking about is the recurring funding that comes from uh, citizen levies. Uh, we're not, we don't have a stand on, on how the school board will choose to pay for the long-range facilities plan. It's our understanding that the, if they do sell Central High School, then that money from Central High School will simply go to pay off the bonds for the buildings. So the buildings are separate from the standard operations, the day-to-day -day operations of the school. And so that we're really, our, our stance right now is on the day-to-day -day operation of the school and the best way to do that. And we believe very strongly that the best way to do that is to maintain the levy and in fact to increase it by a modest amount. Mm -hmm. Paul, the, the money that would be generated from the levy would be used to address class size, um, update the curriculum, raise um, efforts to um, make student achievement more fair. Um, do you agree that the priorities are valid? Uh, I disagree with what you're, you first said. That money will not be used for uh, raising class sizes. And please don't be fooled by this. Uh, remember, they've pulled like $21 million out of the general fund out of three years to, to pay for these plans, the, this building. Keep in mind, what this is like is this is like a family buying a car and it's, it's, so, it's so expensive with all the options that they're going broke because they can't make the payment. And now the, the, the bank's getting ready to repossess. See, they're, they're almost in default. The school district is almost in default. And what will happen when, they're, when the, uh, the, the reserve is, is, runs out, which is, they've been depleting the reserve, and it will run out. And when they do, the state will take over the management of the school district. That's how dire this is, folks. We bought way more than we could possibly ever afford. So to say there's going to be something about class sizes, all this referendum is about is it's raising some money so that when they, there's a teacher contract that's going to have to be settled at right after this, and all that money is going to go into the teacher contract. And, it, you know, they're, I mean, they get a raise every two years. And it's, that's where it's going to be eaten up. There will be maybe a little trickle left, but it will have no effect. In fact, when you have 41 students in a classroom, uh, that, that, that there's no way taking three out is going to make a difference. And it won't even be that many. And uh, so we have to get some honesty. They've been untrue and un, uh, not giving information. Just to get the information that I got, they had to, it, you had to pry it out of them. You know, they have not been forthcoming with information and they're patch, patching their budget together because they're taking money out of the general fund to pay for this, the red plan. Mm -hmm. Clearly, trust is an issue in the district. What are you hearing as you go out and talk to families and talk to residents uh, about the, the levy? Do you still sense that the community uh, largely feels like, like he does? I think the community view of the school board and the decisions it made is very, it's very mixed. Uh, there are certainly a lot of people I've talked to who are just very positive about the school district and they've seen the school district do a lot of good things over the years. Um, there's certainly, I understand, I, I can't say I agree with everything the school district did when it funded the long range facilities plan. However, I would also say that every school board election since then has been a referendum on that. And if that's the case, uh, the public sentiment regarding the school board is very mixed. In fact, many of the school board people who voted in favor of that plan got reelected. Uh, there, I think um, it's, it's always tempting to be distrustful of, the school, of, uh, of institutions, but uh, what I've seen of the Duluth School District is that it's very conscientious. I can say that the current superintendent didn't just dream up this levy out of thin air. He actually based it on a series of meetings he held with community members last spring, the Think Kids. 
Um, and he has gone to the community and he had 60 meetings with various uh, community uh, constituents and he formulated the priorities based on that. And uh, it, I mean, my, my opponent is suggesting that he won't spend the money the way he's saying he will. I think he will. I think the school board has a lot at stake in this. And uh, if they don't, then the voters will hold them accountable for that. So I'm, I'm, I think uh, this, I, I have a different opinion of the school board yeah. than my opponent does, obviously. But I think, I, I, I think when they say they're going to l reduce cl enrollments and classes, that's what they're going to do. John, uh, let me ask you this question. Um, in question number two, one of the selling points is it will allow investment uh, in innovative science curriculum. What does that mean? Well, we got to look forward to the future here. I mean, uh, the the science, the curriculum, the, the students need more training in high tech in particular. They need more access to computers earlier on. We don't have there. that now. There, there certainly is some, but it could be better. Um, this is uh, this is something that um, the school. The school district needs to pay constant attention to. It's a rapidly changing environment, and uh, certainly there is there's plausibly room for improvement in the high tech offerings in our. One schools. question viewers might have: Do we ever reach better? Five years from now, what, can we be better? I think definitely we can reach better. I think that we reach better every year. I mean, there are innovative programs happening in the school district now, and I think that uh, we'll see better programs in the future. Uh, we, we'll, we'll be reaching better without question. Um, and yeah, I'm, I'm very confident that under the current leadership and with adequate support from the community, the school district really can thrive and really, really be a basis for the whole city of Duluth thriving. Mm -hmm. Paul, in your opinion, um is there anything that the school district can do, the, the administration or the board, to earn back that trust of the community? What would it take? Because what, would they, what would it take? Well, it would take them, uh, what we've uh, uh, come up with is having, first of all, figure out the problem that they have with their finances on the red plan and assemble a panel of people who are knowledgeable in the business community and banking and real estate who can fix the problems with this red plan. That it, that's, it's a ghost that's plaguing us. And uh, we've offered a whole list of solutions because we don't criticize without offering solutions. And one of the things, uh, I, I know you talked about all those wonderful programs, but they're not going to get funded by this. Uh, the school district also, keep in mind, they, uh, they have a lot of funding sources from other places, okay? We have uh, we, remember, Governor Mark Dayton pledged that he was going to raise taxes on the wealthy to fund the K-12 through education. Do you remember that? Well, here's what happened. Uh, he's, they've been collecting this new tax, and so at some point we're going to receive all that money coming in. So what I'm saying is we don't need this money for this referendum at this time because that money is going to come in because and and, it's to pay for all of these wonderful ideas. So they've been collecting it. It's down in the state. So why don't we go and tap into that rather than raising taxes? See, the people out there, they don't have time to go to those meetings. People are, you know, they're working and they don't, they, they simply don't have the money to pay more taxes. And, uh, you know, it's easy for you to sit there and say that it, everybody had input. But it's, you know, the, look, we're relying on the school district to, to do things, to do good diligence with our money. We, we put a lot of trust in it, and that's the thing about government. That's why there's not so much participation, because we're always trying to do our things, and we're hoping that these politicians are managing it well, and they're not. This, is, this district is nearly broke. I assure you that, and you will see. John, how do you, how do you ensure accountability if, if it were to pass? Um, are there benchmarks that the community would be able to measure how successful it was? Um, certainly, uh, we, if, this, if, uh, if it passes, then we will all be watching to see how, how the district spends the money. And uh, the district has made it clear that the first priority is to reduce enrollments. Uh, they said they're going to uh, kind of target hot spots at first. That they've acknowledged that there won't be reduction across the board in every classroom and every grade, but that they will, uh, in a very ra rational, reasoned way, uh, go after the areas where there's the greatest need for more instructors and they're going to place them there. We'll watch that and if, if they don't deliver, then we hold them accountable on election day in two years. Quickly, did I hear you say that if it passes, your group will stay in focus and you will monitor what they're doing? 
Uh, our group is advocating for better school funding in the district, and our, our group believes that better school funding will lead to better schools. We do plan to continue to exist, rather, whether the referendum passes or fails. We want to continue to okay. be a voice in favor of public education. Okay. All right, thank you. Well, That's all the time we have. I'm sorry. I want to thank you both for being here tonight. Appreciate it. Now, let's dig into our News File archive for a look at what was making news 25 years ago this week. Pure artesian well water. It's sweet tasting and it has become one of the hottest selling beverages in the country. One of the newest brands is Country Crystal, bottled right here in the Northland. Four investors from Superior heard that below the former Twin Ports Dairy Building in South Superior was an artesian well. That was five years ago. Now, Country Crystal has been in business over a year and is distributing to large chains like Cup Foods, Byerly's, and Super Value. We're just very, uh, just scratching the surface of, of a uh, market in its infancy. And uh, you know, we're going to be there when it starts to really take off. The company currently employs four full-time workers, but expects to at least double that number by next spring. Owners say the water is selling because it's the best on the market. Once people taste our product, they really, really like it. They can tell the difference between ours and the other products, and they end up with ours. the parent of a high school senior preparing to go to college, the cost of a higher education likely has you a bit concerned. The cost of tuition and fees has risen quite a bit since you and I were in college, Denny. Oh, yes. But fortunately, there are scholarship funds available if you know where to look. And this week, the Allworth Fund celebrated its 65th year of providing substantial scholarships to students in northeastern Minnesota. Joining us now is Patty Salo Downs, Executive Director of the Allworth Memorial Fund. Pat Altrichter is the Vice President of the Allworth Fund Board of Directors, and Ryan T. Lander is a senior at UMD who was awarded an Allworth Scholarship to pursue his degree, and welcome. Thanks for coming oh, in. Thank you. Exciting time of the year. Having gone through this with three daughters, I, I know what parents are feeling out there as they start thinking about those scholarships. Um, Patty, share some background on the, on the Allworth Fund. I'd be happy to. Um, in 1949, Marshall W. Allworth established the Marshall H. and Nellie Allworth Memorial Fund. Mm -hmm. And Marshall W., and I have a photo of yeah, him. Yeah, nice picture. Yeah, yeah. and um, he has very kind eyes. I, you know, he was very generous. He, his high priority was higher education, and he wanted to help students who had the potential to go to college do, do so. And so his initial investment was uh, $10,000 and he funded 11 students who happened to be at UMD that year and that paid for full tuition for those students to go to school. How much money is in the in the fund now, the Allworth Fund? $34.5 million. So coming up on $35 wow. million. Dollars. Yeah, yeah. Wow. And so uh, the fund, his focus was math and science. He really appreciated the sciences, had a lifelong love of sure. the sciences and so wow. That, that's yeah. why we have the fund. Uh -huh. Pat, are college scholarships getting hard to find or getting harder to procure? Well, I think there are a lot of scholarships out there, and part of why we're here tonight is to encourage families to um, go out and, and seek them out. Uh, the, the Alworth Foundation is a wonderful example of uh, very generous opportunities for students to secure Funding How many does the Allworth Fund uh, provide in a year's time? Well, it varies, but approximately 60. This oh, past really? year, we funded 60 new scholarships. Mm -hmm. Ryan, talk about that process, that uh, you know, going out on the hunt looking for scholarships. Is um, it stressful? Well, yeah, it de definitely <laughs> stressful, <laughs> especially when you haven't heard back for a little while from some. But uh, I actually heard about the Allworth uh, 
dollar scholarship from my high school counselor and I, I didn't have any idea there was any scholarships like this out there and uh, she told me that I'd be a good candidate and I should apply and you know sure enough I was awarded the scholarship and I, th I think it's so cool that they're able to give this amount of money and help sure. out so many students. Patty, what kind of criteria must be met? Well, there's some uh, academic criteria because Mr. Allworth wanted to fund students with outstanding scholastic ability. So one of the measures certainly is the ACT test exam, a minimum of a 26. You must be in the top 20% of your um, graduating class. And we're looking for, you know, character of perseverance and a genuine interest in math and science and a, a demonstrated mm -hmm. ability and rigorous of curriculum in high school. <laughs> You know, if you just take the regular algebra and the regular, you know, of the sciences and not the honors or the AP, you know, it, it doesn't bode very well. Mm -hmm. uh, well, I know firsthand that that description matches hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of kids out there. Mm -hmm. You must get just inundated with, with scholarship applications. Talk about what makes one rise to the top. Well, it, it is, it is actually quite an honor and a very exciting opportunity to see um, the kind of work that young people like Ryan do in their high school careers and that they work hard and they want to do well and they're passionate about learning and that is so very very exciting for us. I'm a former educator and it's just so fun to see kids at this age pursuing that level of high rigor. So what kind of a scholarship do they get dollar wise? It's, it's a lovely scholarship, $20,000. Payable um, over four years? Over four years or eight semesters. Wow. Mm -hmm. And how does that help out uh, um, a I young think person like you? Could you, have, could you have done it without it? Um, I probably could have, but I think the, the biggest benefit is being able to put all your time into your academics. You know, Less work. Yeah, yeah, no. mm -hmm. yeah you don't have to work Less when you're going to school. Less hamburgers to flip. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. Yeah. Sure. So, um, I think that's the reason I'm going to school is to learn, so I might as well put all my effort into that yeah. while I'm there. Yeah. Mm -hmm. so. and, and why the math and science emphasis? Well, he, he loved the sciences. He felt that um, through the people who were degreed in math and science, that they would be of benefit through, to humanity. And I love mm -hmm. that, you know, to prepare them for careers that may be of benefit to humanity. And you have to remember that in 1949, this was long before the Sputnik and long before any of the governmental aid type, you know, programs yeah, were sure. involved for supporting students to go to school. So he was extremely foresighted. And upon his death, he loved the results of students like Ryan. Uh, he loved what he saw so that his whole estate yeah. was rolled into this fund. Pat, mm -hmm. $20,000 is certainly a generous scholarship, but do you see the day when maybe that will even increase through this fund because of rising tuition costs? Well, I think because of, of the rising tuition costs, and of course as our economy is, is improving, um, the Allworth Fund, like many others, will, will generously want to give as much as they can. But I just think that the cost of college tuition now is such a high, high concern it is. for the families and the students and, and all of us that are looking for, you know, future employees and it's just, it's just wonderful to be able to support kids in this way. Mm -hmm. And you mentioned that um, Duluth has many, many scholarships. Um, is our community unusual yes. in, in terms of the amount of money available? And, and also speak to the fact that, you know, you try to make this as easy for families as possible because there are some common applications and you know how do people go about getting that? Well there is definitely a lot of uh, aid available here in Duluth. I, I think we're like one of the top five cities in the country that has this money pot for, for scholarships and it's local people wanting to support local students and so the application process varies among the, the different scholarships, mm -hmm. but in our situation and many others, it's online. You need to just go check out the websites and a lot of the high school counselors on their web pages, they have all the links to the various scholarships that are available. And, the, and my greatest recommendation is to apply. Even if you think you're marginally qualified, apply. Some of the scholarships, you know, they're, they're scraping the streets looking for people to <laughs> apply. and. Uh, and I just think the students yeah. are missing out on it. Why is that? <laughs> Parents and kids just don't realize the monies are out there? They may not realize it's there, and sometimes kids self-select themselves out of the running. Oh. They think they're not scholarship material. Uh -huh. And so it is a problem, but we try to get out there and 
you know, visit with the counselors and go to the scholarship nights yeah. and talk to parents. Ryan, how far in advance did you have to apply for the scholarship? Um, I think I applied in the fall before I graduated. For the next year? Yep. Mm -hmm. Yep. So I applied in my the fall of my senior year of high I school. See. Yep. And we're almost out of time, but uh, the good news is you already have a job lined up. Yep. <laughs> yep. I was able to, uh, I did a, an internship with Cargill for eight months just this past spring, and they, they offered me a full-time position, so the hard work definitely paid off. There you go. All right. Well, we're <laughs> so proud of him. Yeah, we That's are. Nice. Yeah, he's Thank a great you example. Thank you all for coming in, and uh, parents. Look for those scholarships. Go to scholarship night. That's, <laughs> that's my big advice. Yes. Yes. Thank <laughs> you. Absolutely. Right. Thank you. Good luck. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. Okay, now here are the week's top business stories from Business North. It was the end of one major street project and the beginning of another in the Twin Ports this week. In Superior, the $14 million reconstruction of North Tower Avenue was completed and the thoroughfare was reopened to vehicles this week. The work began in mid-April and since then there has been no traffic along the one-mile downtown stretch. Duluth on Wednesday held its first meeting to address plans to rebuild a similar length of Superior Street in the heart of downtown beginning in 2016. It was the first of six meetings that will be held with stakeholders. For a plan to convert the old Lincoln Park School into housing and office space, the Duluth Economic Development Authority was awarded just over $200,000 by the state for abatement and demolition work as part of the Sherman Associates plan to convert the former elementary school. The project will retain 31 jobs, create two new positions, and increase the city's tax base by nearly $66,000, Dita said. Rehabilitation of the building is set to begin in May. The company that wants to mine iron ore on Wisconsin's Pinocchio Range is questioning findings of asbestos-like fibers in its mineral base. Now, officials of Gogebic Taconite are seeking more information from Northland College professor Tom Fitz, who said he has found concentrations of grunerite rock containing asbestos-like fibers. Fitz has said the fibers are potentially hazardous, but GTAC spokesman Bob Seitz says more lab work needs to be conducted before that determination can be made. He also said it's unclear how big an area contains the grunerite rock. For more on these and other stories, visit businessnorth.com. And if you have a comment, there's still time to call. Dial 218-788-2849 to leave a message or send an email to almanacnorth at wdse.org. Don't forget the WDSE website is a great place to get the latest program updates along with some news and information about our station. And, Denny, it appears that fall temperatures are here to stay now. Oh, the temperatures <laughs> have dropped heavily, but on this day we did get some sunshine, and that was nice to see and feel. It was very yeah. nice. For Denny and the crew here at Almanac North, I'm Julie Zenner. We hope you have a great weekend.